funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. During the Irish War of Independence, which raged from 1919 to 1921, my native county, Kildare, was relatively passive and saw minimal bloodshed and killing, primarily due to the massive British Army presence in the county. James Durney, historian in residence for County Kildare and also author of the book The Civil War in Kildare. Well, during the War of Independence, Kildare was quite passive because if you had a huge military garrison. You had barracks in Nace, Newbridge, Kildare Town, and then the huge complex on the Curra Camp. So the county Kildare was uh, quite enough during the War of Independence. But by the time the Civil War had come along, Kildare had become quite more militant, and we see that bared out in the Civil War. Nine people were killed during the War of Independence period, while in the Civil War period, 45 people died. Huge, huge difference. And it's quite brutal. It's down at ground level between executions, murders, tit-for-tat killings. It's a horrible, dark, dark period of Irish history. And also the history of County Kildare, whose internment camps and prisons housed many anti-treaty IRA during the war as well as witnessing many executions. James Durney. Here on location in Newbridge at the, what was then the huge military uh, barracks belonged to the British, which was later turned into an internment camp in August 1922 and housed 1,500 uh, Republican prisoners, anti-treaty prisoners, within the confines of the barracks often in in dire conditions and just a few miles from where we are seven men were executed six of them from Kildare Town in the biggest mass execution in the Civil War period in total eight men from County Kildare were executed during the Civil War one of the highest amount of people from any county in the country executed and that just bears out the significance of how brutal the Civil War was in County Kildare in the, the death toll alone and the amount of destruction and uh, death that this darkest of wars brought to the Irish countryside. In a nutshell, the Irish Civil War, which lasted from June 1922 to May 1923, had a devastating impact on County Kildare and many of its people. What occurred in County Kildare was symptomatic of how military necessity was used by each side during the conflict to try excuse murderous brutality. With the Irish Civil War, the poet William Butler Yeats's terrible beauty of 1916 became a terrible ugliness. This is the story of the Irish Civil War in County Kildare. The likes of Kildare were so much more violent in the Civil War than in the War of Independence. Kildare was the first county outside Dublin to execute people during the Civil War. People shot, executed, you know, by, by people that they knew. War was not going to be pretty. It's quite bitter and it's quite ruthless, as all Civil Wars are. This was something that was out of control, effectively. It was a stupid war. Brother fighting brother. New generation has to come to terms with now no longer fighting an empire, but fighting themselves. And before we delve into why the Irish Civil War was so vicious in counties like Kildare, first we need to investigate the war's roots. After the Irish War of Independence, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in December 1921 by Michael Collins and other Irish leaders. Now, Although the treaty failed to deliver an Irish Republic, it did nevertheless give a 26-county free state with limited sovereignty. Deep divisions in Irish society over the treaty led to the war. Count Kildare historian Liam Kenny on location at the old British military barracks in Nace, County Kildare. The roots of the Civil War can be, I think it can be viewed on two levels. First of all, the level of principle. 
And there were people, Irish volunteers and leadership figures in the volunteers, Sinn Féin and so on, who genuinely believed that the treaty did not keep faith with the ideals of the Easter Rising and the proclamation. Ireland did not become a republic. Ireland certainly did not become united and so on. And those people, they looked and we, they said, look, 1916, the leaders were executed, others lost their lives and so on. And we're not going to leave this project, you know, half done, if you like. And on the other side, then, on that level of principle, there were those who said, look, uh, this is freedom on which to build freedom. Things are happening around us. This location where we are, the old army barracks site in Ace, where the British army had been installed since 1814, they had marched out of the barracks and out of the barracks is all over Ireland and out of the constabulary stations. Things that Irish people could never have imagined in their lives were happening in front of their eyes. So that's, if you like, the two sides on the level of principle. But also, as we know, in all walks of life, there are personality clashes and things to, that just erupt in, in a big way. And it's very hard to untangle what's a principle position and what's just because A doesn't like B. And there may well have been an impression that Michael Collins, with all his charisma and all his leadership and all the rest of it was maybe taking too much of you like of the attention and it may well have been the case that de Valera and others were you know in their own way they had done their bit too they were in out in 1916 and they maybe you know were a little bit resentful if you like of Collins becoming like this charismatic kind of figure of of the Irish state and those sort of personality clashes as much fueled the fire as the things on the level of principle. Remember one very important point. When they bring the treaty to the public, public opinion is decided in favour of taking and accepting the treaty. So the mass groundswell of support really is actually in favour of this new government. Mario Corrigan, executive librarian and historian with Kildare Library Services. The Anglo-Irish Treaty had massive public support, which was proven in the mid-June 1922 Irish general election, when roughly 78% of the population voted for pro-treaty candidates. In effect, the vast majority of Irish people believed that a flawed peace was preferable to a renewal of violence. So why then, given the election results, were Republicans so vehement in their opposition? Bridget Lachlan, Heritage Officer with Kildare County Council. 1916 and then the War of Independence promised so much and maybe they felt they were sold out and this was a reaction to what we finally ended up with and it wasn't something that neither, neither side really wanted but, but that's what they ended up with so maybe it was a latching out at something that they didn't really want. Well, it could never be acceptable. I mean, there's, there, you know, there was no way they were going to go out, fight the, the British enemy and then at the end accept an oath of allegiance to a foreign king. This is not what they had fought for. This was not proclaimed in 1916. Historian James Durney. Here's T. Royal Dwyer, historian and also author of the book Michael Collins and the Civil War. You have to ask the question, what were they really fighting for? It seemed that they were fighting more against. They were fighting against Collins, but what were they really fighting for? And they had lost their talk about democracy and everything else. They were ignoring the democracy of what happened here right before the Civil War. The anti-treaty position is largely ideological, but in some ways the free state has to be defended. Historian Brian Hughes of the University of Exeter. And whatever about the rights and wrongs of the motives of each side in the Civil War, most Irish people believe that the first shots of the war were fired when the Free State's National Army launched an assault on an anti-treaty IRA garrison in Dublin's Four Courts in late June 1923. However, this isn't necessarily the case. James Durney. The first major incident of the Civil War in Kildare is the Curra Mutiny where there's um, shots fired outside Kildare Barracks. Those shots fired in part as a result of a clash between anti- and pro-treaty factions in the new Irish Civic Guard Police Force. But this is supposedly the first shots of the Civil War fired in April 1922 outside Kildare Barracks, 
where a crossly tender comes up or an armoured car then as well is involved and there's shots fired. So that's the first major incident. And it's worth noting that in mid-June 1922, several civic guards absconded Kildare Barracks after that mutiny with arms and ammunition and joined anti-treaty IRA forces in their garrison in Dublin's four courts. Just a few days later, the kidnapping of Free State General Ginger O'Connell of the Kerr Army Camp in Kildare was a factor which helped to ignite the civil war outright. Curry Camp military historian Reg Darling. The first general officer commanding the Curry Camp, a fellow called General O'Connell, Ginger O'Connell, he was abducted by the Republicans and brought into the Four Courts. And to say that was one of the reasons that it precipitated the Civil War because Collins gave them, say, 24 hours to release O'Connell. And O'Connell did get out. I don't know whether they released him or he escaped. But he, he, uh, he, he got out anyway. But the Civil War started then with the bombardment of the, the Four Courts. And, but that, that would have led back then to, to, to the mutiny in Kildare where the weapons were allegedly brought from Kildare barracks, the guard barracks in Kildare depot, up to the uh, four courts. The outbreak of the Civil War on June the 28th, 1922, split many families down the middle, especially in County Kildare. Historian James Durney. Well, the Kelly family in Newbridge would be one prime example that uh, two brothers, one takes uh, an opposite side of each other on, on the treaty and that, and one is interned in Newbridge uh, internment camp and the other guy's a, he's an officer in the National Army, you know. So, I mean, this is this is right to the core of it. Just people take opposing views and this is what they do. They take the side that they think is, is the right side or the best side. Like with all civil wars, it was you know brother against brother. So you know you could have had a, a situation where one brother w- was on the the pro treaty and one guy decided on on the anti treaty. So I mean straight away then you had two different opinions in a family and they were fighting against one another to you know to kill one another basically. So that's that's how families were s- split down the middle. County Kildare military historian Finton Darling. So how did the early stages of the unfolding conflict impact? on County Kildare. When the Civil War is declared, there's a lot of the Kildare Republicans are involved in the fight in around Blessington and thereabouts, and then it devolves into a kind of guerrilla warfare within uh, Kildare, but it's slow to start and it's slow to take off uh, because really people's heart aren't in it uh, on both sides, and there was a reluctance to engage and kill, but this doesn't last too long, and eventually it gets bitter especially after the death of Michael Collins, because this is, a, this is a turning point that the chief, the man that everyone loved, the man that they say won the War of Independence, he's killed. He stops off in Nace and Kildare on the way down to Cork at the time. And um, when he's killed in an ambush, things really changed and, you know, they get really, really bitter. Michael Collins was killed by an anti-treaty IRA sniper in County Cork on August 22nd, 1922. As historian James Durney just touched on, with Collins's moderating force gone, the war became much more brutal and vindictive. County Kildare historian Brian McCabe. I think that was one of the one of the key events which effectively changed the tenor of the whole thing. Um, after Collins had been removed from the scene, there was definitely a hardening of attitudes on the part of, of the government side. And that was reflected, as far as I know, right across the country. Uh, the people in control weren't. I think, you know, when Collins was there, he was always trying to, you know, hope there'd be some sort of reconciliation, sending out feelers and so on. Uh, that all ceased and, you know, it became effectively a, a war to the death almost at that point. So it had a terribly detrimental effect. The most immediate result, you know, was the uh, executions which started to take place uh, after that. And with the Civil War ongoing, the Free State's National Army began a massive build-up. John Dorney, independent historian and also author of the book Peace After the Final Battle, the story of the Irish Revolution. The priority in the late summer of 1922 for the head of the 
the pro-treaty army is that they have to occupy the main centres of population. So they, they issue a call for recruits, a call, national call to arms, and they get recruits from all over the country. They get thousands and thousands of recruits. The national army goes from maybe 6,000 when the Four Court siege begins, if that, to 14,000 by the end of July, to 30,000 by the end of August, you know, to 55,000 by the end of the Civil War. So you have a big influx of people. A lot of them are veterans of the British Army of the First World War. A lot of them have no experience, they're very young. A lot of, some of them are doing it for idealistic reasons. Some of them are former national volunteers, for example, who were against the militant split and the volunteers back to 1914. But a lot of whom are doing it for a job. But my point is, it's a pretty ramshackle force. They put these out into towns all over the country, including Kildare, even though Kildare is proximate to Dublin. It's still the case that what they do is they garrison the towns, but they don't have control over the countryside, even to a lesser extent than, than the British back in the War of Independence, because these are badly trained soldiers. There is a shortage of trained officers. The IRA officers who initially are mo- most of the officer corps don't have experience in conventional armies. What they have experience as gr- is guerrillas. And a prime example of an anti-treaty IRA guerrilla ambush occurred in October 1922 in Graney near Castle Dermot in South County Kildare. James Journey. It was a National Army party under command of a lieutenant and they were ambushed near Graney in South Kildare. Uh, three National Army soldiers were killed. One of them was only 16 years of age. And you can understand that he's underage when he joins the army. He has absolutely no experience whatsoever. Many of these guys were just even given a, a rifle and a basic rudimentary training. And uh, you, you'll see that happening in throughout the National Army. A lot of lads shooting themselves by accident and that. And, you know, these are the type of guys that are ambushed then by seasoned veterans, you know, that had been under arms for the last couple of years. And the ambush is pretty brutal. There's three of them fall out. A crossly tender turns over on its side and three of them fall out. And while they're on the road, the tender shot then as well. I mean, it's pretty vicious and it's pretty uh, ruthless. And then the, the ambush party, which is about 20 of them or so, head off then with all the captured equipment and whatever they can. And, and one of the, the, the victims or, that survived says he actually witnessed three men that he recognised. So it's, it's quite local, you know, these guys know one another. And, uh, y- you know, you, you, un- you try to understand then why there's so much bitterness and why so much viciousness among former comrades or even former neighbours, or even relatives. And that's what it boils down to. It is brother against brother. And it does happen in Kildare that there's brothers on either side. The Free State soldiers are going around in columns, which aren't very well protected, which aren't very well scouted. They're getting ambushed. Six, seven of them get killed at a time, I think, in, in one ambush in Kildare, if I'm not mistaken. There's another load killed down in Castle Dermot. And, and, and it's the same thing. It's poorly scouted columns. They're, they're travelling to and from the destination the same way. They're easy to predict. And they get hit by the guerrillas. John Dorney. So what was the nature of typical IRA guerrilla activity? Liam Kenny. Their tactics were pretty much as they had been during the War of Independence. The disruption of means of communications, of railways, of telegraph lines and so on. The burnings of uh, barracks and so on. And... Just the general type of conflict that comes with guerrilla war, ambushes, shootings, all of that kind of thing. And that's really because they didn't have access to heavy equipment and so on. That's the kind of tempo that the anti-treaty side were, were operating in. And when you're involved in those kind of guerrilla tactics, then the targets become the military installations or police installations and most importantly, the communications infrastructure. Historian Mario Corrigan. So in Kildare, which is traversed by numerous bridges, whether it be canal or rail or road, they always were going to be prime targets. But the railways, I mean, transporting troops to and from in and out of Dublin. And of course, even though the British have now left, you still have the residue, you have a, a barrack still in existence in Kildare Town. And you have obviously that on the periphery, you've got the Curra. So the new National Army, transporting supplies and men up and down along the railway. Railway lines become really important for the the guerrillas. In terms of Republican activity, that's where they're going to focus a lot of their strength and their power. An example would be in the Curra siding, the flying column would, would take pot shots at the National Army troops getting off trains and going to the Curra. 
quite a few of the Rat Bride column worked on the railways, so they used the railway line as a form of attack against the, the Free State. You know, they'd burn out carriages and the like, and there's reports that they, they looted shops in, in, in Kildare Town and stuff like this, so that, that would have been their modus operandi, just creating a nuisance. Military historian Finton Darling. However, such nuisance-making was often counter-productive and alienated the guerrillas from public support. James Durney. The typical IRA activity was the blowing up of bridges, dismantling of uh, railway tracks, general destruction and all this. And this is what alienates them from the people. The guerrillas are supposed to swim in the stream as fish with the people and that. It doesn't work. You know, it did work in 19. 2021 when they had the support of the people but by 1922 the local people just can't understand why these guys are going around and and blowing up bridges that brings them to and fro where they want to go destruction of railways and there's a huge amount of destruction in around Kildare and throughout the whole country and this is what turns the people against them and this is where they lose support and it's all people want is just law and order return they just want back to normality they want to get on with their own lives just the ordinary bread and butter issues which is huge because i mean we're talking about 1922 23 ireland is still a poor place it's still hard to put a a loaf of bread on the table and people just want to get on they've had enough of the war they've had the first world war they've had the war of independence they just want peace and they don't care what price the guerrillas they start to run out of ammunition the army starts to develop its, and the national army starts to develop its intelligence because although they're not that well trained, they're very good. They know exactly who these people are. And they, unlike the British, they have sympathy of pretty much most of the population, particularly in Kildare, which if you look at the votes in elections is very much a pro treaty county in terms of sympathies. But they start to arrest more than kill guerrillas, really. But the killer blow for the Kildare guerrillas is two incidents in the turn of the year in December 22 and January 23 when there's a firefight in Leakslip and a column which had been particularly active was, was rounded up in Leakslip. Indeed, the anti-treaty IRA column rounded up in Leakslip had engaged in a running firefight with the National Army at Pikes Bridge near Leakslip before being eventually captured. James Durney. Well, Pikes Bridge happened, it was Paddy Milani's calling. Paddy Milani was a school teacher from Mayo who was uh, teaching in Leakslip. And in late 1921, he had formed a flying column in the North Kildare Mead area. And they had operated against communications in uh, the War of Independence period. They were involved in the aborted Stacumney ambush near Selbridge. In 1922, he's doing the same thing. He's attacking communications in the area. And uh, in one incident, the ambush ration party at Pikes Bridge just outside Leakslip. And uh, they capture a couple of, of soldiers, but uh, National Army soldiers burn a truck and that. But then they're attacked from three different sides, then from the National Army coming to the rescue of this group. And uh, there's a, a run and firefight in the general area between the column and uh, the National Army, who uh, actually bring, I think, an armoured car up from Nace then as well and they're chasing one another across fields. One National Army soldier is killed, several are wounded, and then the column is surrounded and captured. I think there's 22 of them or something, or thereabouts, captured, and they're fully armed. With them, however, are four guys that have deserted from the National Army who had been based in Baldonnell and had been willing to strike against their comrades, their former comrades, in Baldonnell, which this was a great plan that, among others, Jim Dunn from Kill had, was that they were going to attack Baldonnell Airdrome, capture it, get a plane, and they had an officer then that they were going to be able to fly the plane and bomb Leinster House. This was an, an idea that they had, and this would probably end the war, the Civil War. Of course, it never worked out, and the guys had been waiting within the National Army, and when it didn't happen, deserted then to the anti-treaty forces. Four of these guys are actually captured at Pikes Bridge and similarly executed then afterwards in Portobello Barracks for treason. They're charged with treason and taken up arms against the provisional government and they're executed. Two of them are actually from Kildare and two of them are from County Mead. One of the most controversial aspects of the Irish Civil War was the Free State Government's execution of dozens of anti-treaty IRA. 
such as the four IRA men just mentioned by historian James Durney, who were captured at Pikes Bridge near Leakslip. The policy of executions was begun shortly after the death of Michael Collins, in the belief that it would hasten the war's end. County Kildare witnessed many executions, perhaps the most infamous being the execution of seven members of the so-called Rat Bride Column, Finton Darling. Kildare was the first county outside Dublin to execute people during the Civil War. The first seven men were executed in the detention centre, which is locally known as the Glass House in the Curra camp. They were Patrick Bagman, Patrick Mangan, Joseph Johnson, Brian Moore, Patrick Nolan, Stephen White and James O'Connor. All of these men were members of the IRA and from the Kildare area, with the exception of James O'Connor, who was from County Tipperary. And they, you know, they were part of a flying column which was active in the Curra Kildare area during the Civil War. And they were actually known by the Free State authorities as the Rat Pride Column. And these guys, anyway, were sentenced to death by General Court Martial and executed on the Curry Camp. Curry Camp military historian Reg Darling. And I can remember asking this old soldier, this man I knew, Mr. Byrne, he was a quartermaster sergeant in McDonough Barracks in the Curry, about those executions. And he told me that they didn't know about them, the soldiers in, in the area, that presumably they were carried out by uh, the uh, Dublin Guard, which was. Collins's special group. They were they were kind of a, a group that were, uh, grew from the Twelve Apostles, you know, the, the guys who were involved with Bloody Sunday. But anyway, he, he said that the general population, uh, army population on the Curra didn't know anything about these. The military police, of course, would have known and the chaplains on the Curra camp, but the general populace didn't know. It seems to be pretty vindictive that we're going to stop this. These were the guys known as the Rat Bride Column, and we're going to put an end to their activity in the area. So it's a deliberate, well, I think it's a deliberate intention then to execute these guys, get rid of them once and for all. There's no point putting them behind bars. We're going to just close this thing down in this Kildare area, and that's what to do, to execute seven of them. And it causes huge bitterness in the town for many, many years after. James Durney. In modern Kildare Town, there's a monument commemorating the Rat Bride Column executions. Kildare historian Mario Corrigan. Sad thing is, like, I grew up in Kildare and I remember actually asking my mother what that big, huge white cross was on the market square. And I remember being dragged, physically dragged from it and said, oh, we don't talk about that thing. And, I mean, that gives us some sort of hint that what happens in an area when this type of atrocity, and I'm not not saying an atrocity perpetrated by one side or another, but this tragedy happens within a a local area. So, I mean, the the area is instantly devastated, not by some distant war and some distant front, but the fact that by its very nature it's happening on the streets and on the roadways all around the locality. Then young men who were playing football maybe the previous week week with the local football team are taken captured and are executed the parents are refused access to them and whatever chance you have of bringing a situation to a close surely now you've hardened the lines to such an extent that the bitterness remains for generations and it does it's some 80 years before that incident was talked about publicly in Kildare Town, where these men had lived and worked. So what was the ultimate impact of such executions on the likes of County Kildare? I'd say people were traumatised by it, particularly the, the Republicans in the area. People are very worried about getting caught with guns. They're worried about their comrades who have been already captured, if they're going to be shot. So it certainly has a terrorising effect. The executions were designed to break the morale of the Republicans in Kildare. You know, these guys were intent on putting an opposition up to the treaty that that Collins had gone over and signed. So the government found support in adopting harsh measures for such executions. And did the contentious policy of executions have the desired effect for the Free State government? Military historian Finton Darling. 
It did, of course, yeah. The executions swiftly brought an end to the Irish Civil War. I mean, it, it lasted less than a year, and you know the Republicans were type of fragmented, and this broke them even more. So it had the desired effect. The Republican number is that there were 77 official executions. In fact, there were 81, and there may have been even one or two more because Emmett Dalton, the National Army Commander in Cork, had recently come out, executed a, a deserter before even that in September, early September 22. So there was probably about 82 executions, and there was a few more who were armed robbers who were executed. So it was a very ruthless policy of, of official executions. The historian John Dorney. There was an unofficial policy among mainly people who were pro-treaty IRA men, volunteers, of reprisal killings. Michael Collins' squad was very much involved in this. And there are various figures, like there's a Republican Roll of Honour with 115 names on it, who were what they called murdered in custody. Todd Andrews has a list of 153 names. You know, there was fairly ruthless targeting of the anti-treatyites by pro-treaty forces, by free state forces. Now, I want to say two things about this, though, in mitigation. And so again, it comes down to the two arrival mindsets, if you like. When you start to count the casualties on both sides, you you start to see a very interesting thing, which is that after the initial phase of the Civil War, when the anti-treatyites are driven from towns and so forth, the pro-treatyites are trying to occupy the country and they're badly trained, they're running into ambushes all the time. Actually, for quite a a number of months, pro-treaty soldiers, free state soldiers, are getting killed in bigger numbers than anti-treatyites, substantially bigger numbers. One of the big reasons for that is because the anti-treatyites just surrender and they get taken prisoner. And they get taken prisoner in massive numbers rather than killed. And the executions and the reprisals from the free state point of view, again, not justifying, but trying to explain, both the reprisals and the executions from the free state side are actually evening the score because the anti-treatites are hard to find, even though they have advantages the British didn't have. But they're they're hiding in the mountains or they're hiding in back streets in safe houses. They're difficult to find. When they find them, they generally surrender. So the pro-treaty side as well, I mean, as Ernest Blythe, who was a minister in the free state government, said, nobody got the firing squad but who deserved it. You know, their thinking also hardened over the Civil War. Sadly, each side violated the rules of war during the Irish Civil War, with on the one hand Free State National Troops carrying out many unofficial reprisals, and on the other hand the anti-treaty IRA not being above shooting unarmed civilians. In a nutshell, all sides had blood on their hands. The policy of meeting terror with terror was the most important tactic used by both sides in the Civil War. Terrible bitterness that we know is the the legacy of the Civil War was really a product of the executions. The bitterness of the Civil War was so intense that they basically lost their reason. Once you adopt, the, I think, the mindset of, of, of either party, what they do makes total sense. But when you step back from it and you say, what's the point of all this? It, 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 looks, like, it looks like utter madness. Throughout the Irish Civil War, and for a considerable time after it officially ended, many anti-treaty IRA Republicans were kept in internment camps and prisons in County Kildare. James Durney. There's huge internment camps in County Kildare then as well. There's one in Newbridge Barracks, which was a former cavalry barracks for the British Army. There's 1,500 prisoners held in this um, barracks, in wooden huts and in uh, par- uh, stone barracks of the the old barracks. And uh, they also have an internment camp on the Curra, which is called Tin Town, because the huts are kind of made of tin where... These horses were would have been kept originally, and this is these stables are converted then into an internment camp. So you can imagine the conditions. They wouldn't have been the best. They wouldn't have been the most hygienic. Also, living conditions in internment camps such as Tin Town were often less than desirable. Reg Darling. There were other people who died there in around that time, from natural causes from diseases and things so there must have been in horrendous conditions about two years ago this American guy called into me on the car and he was telling me he was trying to trace his uh, granduncle's grave this granduncle apparently died on the car in 1923 around Christmas time and uh, he was uh, like an orphan 
and he had joined the Republican movement. He was picked up in Kerry and incarcerated on the Curra, and he died from, it turned out he died from TB. By April 1923, anti-treaty IRA activities had dwindled throughout most of the country, in particular in counties such as Kildare. When IRA leader Liam Lynch was killed that April, he was succeeded by Frank Aiken, who shortly afterwards in May 1923 ordered the dumping of IRA arms and the end of hostilities. Finton Darling. The war was, was over and there was a, a sense of type of normality again. People were focusing on, on political issues and stuff again and, and money was, was a huge thing. Kildare's population, which had increased in the first decade of the 20th century, had declined by 12.9% from a total of 66,627 6, in 1911 to 58,028 in 1926. So in Kildare, the local government found themselves between two extremes. The need to reduce rates to relieve the taxpayers and the need to initiate works to alleviate the suffering of the unemployed. So, I mean, there was a... A return to normal type of financial issues and stuff that the county had suffered hugely from the Civil War from a financial point of view and obviously from people dying in in, in the county as a result of the, the Civil War. The peace which followed the IRA's dumping of arms was an uneasy one and although the Civil War was officially over it petered out slowly rather than stopped suddenly but sporadic killings continuing for a good period afterwards. Also by war's official end thousands of IRA Republicans languished in internment camps especially in County Kildare. They were released on a gradual basis rather than all at once. John Dorney. The end of the Civil War again is quite complicated because they didn't release the prisoners until... They released most of the prisoners in the summer of the following year, in late night 23 or the summer of 24. But the most hardline prisoners, the highest ranking members of the IRA, were not released until November 1924. And there was a big hunger strike in December 1923 by the prisoners to try to get themselves released, you know, because the Civil War was over. I think the official numbers that three prisoners died in the hunger strike were one of them dies actually in Newbridge Barracks, Dennis Barry. Well, he was on hunger strike in Newbridge Barracks and he's brought to the Curra Military Hospital where he dies. And they didn't want to hand his body over when he died as well. And this is the vindictiveness what we're talking about. Historian James Durney. Although the official figure is that three IRA prisoners died on hunger strike, the truth is that many more died from ill health after effects in the coming years. John Dorney. The IRA Roll of Honour is full of people who, who they say died as a result of the after effects of the hunger strike. And some of them were added actually onto their official Roll of Honour and some weren't. There's correspondence going back and forth saying, no, we don't think this guy died on active service, you know. But it, it, there was a very bitter end. It was, a, you know, there's a great line about the, the Boer War in South Africa, but, you know, between the white communities saying an alp of unforgiveness grew out of the Boer War. And, and you know, it, it couldn't be better placed about the Irish Civil War. It was a terrible legacy of, of, of bitterness and mistrust and poison that came out of the Civil War. A lot of people ask, why was the IRA of the War of Independence defeated so quickly in the Civil War? And as General Maxwell, bloody Maxwell himself, the executioner of 1916, he said by forces that even Britain wouldn't have dared to do. And this was the execution, so the rounding up wholesale of Republicans. Throughout the, the War of Independence period, you have at peak, you have 5,000 men, and it's basically only after Bloody Sunday that that internment really begins. You have up to 5,000 men jailed or interned in that whole period. Within a, a period of, of a year in the Civil War, you have 15,000 men behind barbed wire. The problem with the British was that they don't have the eyes and ears. They don't know who they're looking for. Their intelligence is not great. They don't know who are Republicans to round up innocent people, to round up lads that are only on the fringes of, of even the Labour Party or the, of Sinn Féin. But in the Civil War, the National Army or the Free State Authorities round up everyone connected because they know who they are, they know who they're looking for. And that's how they're able to get that advantage then as well. Then ruthlessly, they execute 77 men within what is a six-month period 
where in a six-year period the British only execute 37, and that's including those in, in 1916. So it's that then, plus the fact that the National Army is numerically superior than the IRA, the anti-treat element of the IRA. You have maybe 10,000 men in the field of the IRA at anti-treaty elements, and then you have another 60,000 or so of the National Army. So they're having a chance, and it's doomed from the beginning. There's a reluctance to fight then as well on the anti-treaty side at the beginning, which um, materialises then that both sides become quite ruthless and quite entrenched. One of the big reasons why they lost it was because public support was for the treaty and people wanted peace and they were, they were kind of sick of war as it was at the time. So the War of Independence had, had just kind of finished and you know there was a sense of people getting back to normality and stuff again and the economy was a focus on people's minds and they were just sick of war and that, that was it. Military historian Finton Darling. The Civil War actually nearly bankrupted the country. So, you know, that's another thing that people were, were, were just, just wanted to get back on track, a bit of normality in their lives again, and get a government going and, and go down the democratic route. That's what people wanted. And although the anti-treaty IRA lost the civil war, nevertheless, this military defeat allowed politicals such as Eamon de Valera to emerge from the shadows of hardline, no-compromise militants who had prosecuted their cause to destruction. By 1926, Eamon de Valera had established a Fianna Fáil political party and in the year 1927, he and many other anti-treatyites took their seats in the Free State Parliament, which just a few years before they had sought to destroy. By 1932, Eamon de Valera had become leader of the new state, John Dorney. In 1932, of course, Eamon de Valera's Fianna Fáil, which was built from the ashes of the anti-treaty IRA and anti-treaty Sinn Féin, came to power peacefully in election. Now, to their credit, coming to nail the pro-treaty party, they ceded power peacefully. In effect, the new Free State Ireland was ultimately a political nation. Its default setting was political, not military, as Eamon de Valera's coming to power proved. It did politics almost by instinct. Historian Brian Hughes of the University of Exeter. I think one of the, the great achievements of Cumann and Ale in, in government is the fact that by the early 30s they're able to transition power peacefully. That they hand over power and that that happens without any, any violence. And again, given the context of what's going on in wider Europe, it's a real achievement. And, and essentially it shows that in those 10 years that Cumann and Ale were in power, a democracy is established. Who won the long-term peace as it was the people of Ireland did and the political system won the long-term peace, you know, whether that was Fianna Gael, whether that was Fianna Fáil, Labour or, you know, the different political parties. So, you know, democratically as it was, people won out. And until we meet again some other hidden avenue of Irish history, I'm going to leave you with the views of various contributors concerning the Civil War's ultimate legacy for County Kildare and also the Irish nation. We begin with historian James Durney. The legacy of the Civil War, especially in Kildare, in the War of Independence, nine people were killed in that period of the War of Independence. In the Civil War, 45 people died. So it just goes to show you how deep and bitter it became. It was probably the most defining war of of that that period of the you know between the rise and the war of independence and the civil war the civil war defined ireland more so the ultimate legacy of the civil war is i would say almost entirely negative i can't see any positives that, that came out of it. it it poisoned a lot of the idealism that was in the irish revolution it made the state very kind of cautious and, and repressive like how many states when they come into being lock up twelve thousand of their citizens and execute 80 plus of them hopefully not too many the legacy was that people were fighting the Civil War into the 1960s. There were families, actually, that kind of didn't talk to one another because they took different sides in the Civil War. As um, William Butcher Yeats said about, you know, 16, a terrible beauty is born, one might say about the Civil War that a terrible ugliness was born. And this has formed the political landscape, some might say, to this very day. 
in the country and it divided families and it was brother against brother, as all civil wars are pretty ruthless affairs. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.